we get a really good view of how tall the seawall actually is. You don't want to fall off. Oh. What's up, bro? For many visitors who come to Galveston, it's easy to associate the seawall with entertainment and recreation. For those of us who have been here for a while and witnessed the incredible stopping power of the Galveston seawall, we associate it with protection from hurricanes and the resilience of the city. What a monumental task for the early 1900s. Every inch contains over 40,000 pounds of concrete. It's pretty sturdy. Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. Let's talk about five major infrastructure projects that helped protect Galveston from storms, hurricanes, floods, and helped bring life back to Galveston after the nation's deadliest natural disaster. We know these five projects today as the Galveston Seawall. Thank you to our sponsor, Texas' oldest newspaper, The Daily News, bringing you the news since 1842. Go out and support your local newspaper, The Daily News. This is the portion of the seawall that set the tone for the rest of the century, building Galveston's reputation as a resilient city. To talk about the Galveston seawall without talking about the grade raising is a crime, but we're gonna have to put that in a video all on its own. But for a little bit of context, the grade raising of Galveston was a massive project in conjunction with the seawall would help protect the city of Galveston from future floods and storms. In this short video today, we will just be talking about the Galveston seawall and cover the grade raising a little bit later. The Galveston seawall we know today was built in five sections between 1902 and 1963, a 10 mile barrier between the city of Galveston and the temperamental Gulf of Mexico. So why was the seawall built? Up until September 8, 1900, Galveston was the premier city on the Gulf Coast. With a thriving port and a significant business district, Galveston was a major driver of the Texas economy. Before the seawall and grade raising project, the highest point of elevation on Galveston Island was just over eight feet, making the average elevation of the entire island just a few feet above sea level. Seawall projects had been discussed since the 1870s. Cities along the Gulf Coast were continually destroyed by hurricanes. For example, the city and port of Indianola, a competitor of Galveston and major immigration hub into Texas, was completely decimated in 1875 and again in 1886, ultimately leading to the abandonment of that city and port. Unfortunately, funding issues and disagreements between city leaders kept some sort of storm barrier from being built in Galveston. And then the Great Storm of 1900 decimated Galveston Island, killing over 6,000 people and shattering a major portion of the economy in Texas. Survivors knew something had to be done. The storm surge during the 1900 storm was at least 15 feet high. So when they constructed the seawall, they built it to be 17 feet high. Be careful, because you don't want to fall off designed to protect the city from the battering waves and storm surge directly from the Gulf of Mexico. The seawall is 16 feet wide at its base and five feet wide at the top. They drove these 40 foot pilings deep into the ground to reach the clay layer of sediment under the sand. The construction crews built a rail line behind the planned seawall. In order to navigate the heavy machinery for the project, they would frame out the concave shape of the seawall with wood and brought a giant rail mounted concrete mixer and started pouring concrete. They piled a layer of granite at the foot of the seawall to protect the waves from washing out the sand underneath. This granite layer is called riprap. If you're on the beach and you find a good low spot where the sand hasn't built up so much around the bottom of the seawall, you can get a really good view of the riprap that was used to reinforce the footing of the seawall. And behind this wall, it was to be bolstered with a couple hundred feet of sand, which is pretty much what Seawall Boulevard is built on today. This first portion of the seawall extends from 6th Street down to 39th Street, just over three miles. For every inch in length, the seawall contains 40,000 pounds of concrete. The seawall is designed to be concave, so when the giant waves hit the seawall, the energy is dispersed upward and back out. This first seawall project commenced in 1902 and was completed in 1904. When this first stretch of seawall was complete, it proved to the world that Galvestonians were not going anywhere. The east side of the original seawall can be easy to overlook these days. When it was constructed, it curved north at 6th Street and extended towards the port of Galveston. In the early 20th century, 6th Street was once the extreme east end of the urbanized portion of Galveston. This remarkable feat, paired with the grade raising, was accomplished without federal funding. The city and county of Galveston funded this entirely through bonds. 
Every section of seawall after the first seawall project was constructed using an identical or similar process. The second section of the seawall was built by the federal government from 39th to 53rd Street, and for obvious reason, to protect Fort Crockett. Fort Crockett was a U.S. Army installation established in the 1890s. It was pretty much wiped out during the storm of 1900, so the federal government knew they needed to protect this area. Fort Crockett was used during World War I and World War II to train troops before being sent to Europe. It was also used as artillery and a garrison for the United States to protect Galveston. You can still see the gun emplacements between 45th and 49th Street and under the San Luis Hotel. This section started in December of 1904 and was completed in September of 1905. The third portion of the seawall was a joint effort between the county and the federal government to extend the seawall east towards the ship channel. This portion of the seawall, known as the East End Extension, was constructed to protect more of the east end of Galveston, growing shipping interest in Galveston Bay and Fort San Jacinto, which is right over here through these trees, a military installation built to protect Galveston Bay. As the urbanized portion of Galveston expanded westward, so did the seawall. In 1929, the seawall was extended from 53rd Street to 61st Street. The fifth and final section of the seawall extended from 61st Street westward to about 103rd Street. This section was completed between 1951 and 1963. Here on the extreme west end of the seawall, we get a really good view of how tall the seawall actually is. The sand doesn't build up along this beachfront as much as it does on the eastern side. These are much larger pieces of granite to protect the footing of the seawall, which we can actually see here on the west end. Don't worry, I'm a trained professional. Oh, got it. So even on a day when the waves are pretty mild, you're able to see basically what the riprap is doing, breaking up the waves of the Gulf before they hit the seawall. One thing I will mention is that the Galveston seawall is meant to protect us from the waves from the Gulf of Mexico. Of course, storm surge is still a huge problem. For instance, during Hurricane Ike, billions of gallons of water flooded into Galveston Bay, and that water had nowhere else to go, pretty much flooding all of the low-lying areas on Galveston Island. But can you imagine what the devastation would be like if Galveston Island did not have a seawall? In this short video, it is pretty difficult to encompass everything about the Galveston seawalks, including the engineers, the financials, some of the engineering feats that were accomplished, but this gives you a brief overview of some of the projects that have helped protect Galveston for over a century. We are very low and close to the water. We have to thank our Galvestonian ancestors. At the end of the day, we all make a choice. One of those choices is where we live. We live on a barrier island, a place where we are prone to hurricanes. During hurricane season, our lives can be full of anxiety. You never know what's gonna happen, but I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. So here we are at the end of the video. If you learned anything at all or you enjoyed this video, please consider sharing it. If you haven't yet, go check out the podcast, Galveston Unscripted. We've got tons of interviews and historical content on that podcast feed. And you can find us all over social media, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Just search us, Galveston Unscripted. We are working on preserving history in the most fun way we know how. And that is by diving into podcasts, making videos like this, and creating social media content that's fun and engaging. Check out the links in the description for any pertinent details or if you want to support Galveston Unscripted in any way. We'll see you next time on Galveston Unscripted. You don't want to fall off.